Well, I hope everybody enjoyed the lunch. It's uh, unfortunate on some level that we couldn't continue this outside given the beautiful weather today. Uh, and, and also, I want to extend a, um, a, a gracious uh, thank you for coming and taking the time to all the panelists today. Uh, you will see their, of course, their bios and the publication we have today. But I want to do a, a brief introduction, and then we'll proceed um, to individual short presentations uh, by the panelists to give us some context and orientation uh, of the uh, what this panel really is about. I think we've uh, earlier today we've taken on a number of issues relating to design financing, but I think this is a good opportunity to step back and think really from a comparative perspective um, notions of the uh, institutional and organizational factors and influences uh, that are driving some of the, let's say, more normative design propositions and development models in waterfront development. So I'll get started uh, very briefly here with uh, Ulas Akin, who's uh, Chief of International Projects at Bitmas in Istanbul uh, and manages uh, and works uh, with the Istanbul Metropolitan Planning and Urban Design Center uh, and is also um, a, a serving both the professional and academic capacity in advancing doctorate work in this field. Uh, Solskahana Mahajan is an urban planning consultant at the Mumbai Transformative Support Unit uh, and has worked with a, a variety of international organizations including UN Habitat. Uh, of course to my left here is uh, John Allschuler who has actually served in uh, a number of years in service to the university here, but also is chairman of HRNA, and really uh, his work has spanned um, the, the, across the United States and across the globe in taking on these issues uh, relating to urban design and development. And finally, uh, Vitor Hugo de Santos de Pinto, uh, uh, Santos Pinto, excuse me, uh, is head of real estate funds at Caixa, uh, which is the one of Brazilian's fourth largest bank where he manages five billion US dollars uh, of various investment uh, vehicles. And it's really quite an honor to have you all here. And in the interest of time, I think we'll proceed if, if John, you could uh, give us some background, uh, particularly for our international guests uh, with the state of New York. Sure. Um, you know, our waterfront uh, was shaped in the 19th century by the great economic function of our city, which was as a center of manufacturing, trade, and production. Uh, we're here, this institution is here, uh, because of New York's preeminence along the harbor as a great trading power. You know, when I was born, 50,000 people worked the docks of the city of New York. Uh, Wall Street and all the images you see of finance were, sort of didn't amount to a rounding error in the employment structure of, of, of our community. Uh, we made every garment worn by every woman in America. We brewed half the beer drunk in America. We fabricated the machines and the parts used all over our country. And these are the demands that shaped the waterfront. As this great industrial glacier sort of pulled back from the edge and left behind this residue of economically obsolete property. We then entered into this transformation with a legal and regulatory system designed to manage a transition of a 19th century city into a 20th century city and really wholly obsolete when faced with the transition of a 20th century city into a 21st century city. Um, it's obsolete in, in, in two ways. Um, one, uh, we inherited a government with a series of siloed agencies, each responsible for their particular function. Transportation, water sewer, parks and open space, zoning and regulation, uh, finance. Each of our great places, and they are truly great, and there are several people in this room who deserve credit for, for, for several of them, and you'll, you'll hear from Regina later. Um, each of these great places came together because those silos had to be broken down and integrated into a single delivery system. Uh, because the basic pattern of infill development, which dominates the inland portions of the city, the responsibilities shatter and break down when confronted with the need to create new place. So we had to create a series of new integrated structures. The map behind me, uh, uh, prepared thankfully uh, by, by GSAP in Columbia, um, shows you in different colors 
the swath of our edge controlled by these new governmental corporations. And as you can see, they dominate most of the waterfront. Um, it took uh, the Brooklyn Bridge Park Corporation, the Hudson River Park Trust, the Battery Park City Authority, and I can go on, the Queens West Corporation, I can go on. These new creations were necessary because the government, absent this intervention, was unable to combine a functional departmental structure into an integrated system to develop place. The second thing that was necessary is the basic form of our zoning is obsolete in the face of dealing with these waterfront areas. Uh, take what's, I think, one of our greatest challenges right now, which is the obsolescence of our definition of manufacturing. Um, we have a manufacturing definition left over from when manufacturing rightly was noxious, noisy, often dangerous given the trucks involved, uh, and therefore people were told you can't live near this stuff and, and you can't have an office building near there. Well, that's a silly definition for much of the manufacturing that goes on in New York City today. Um, you know, manufacturing includes a whole t series of artisanal food production, producing sets for Broadway, uh, the product of a, of, of a, of a laser printer, um, these, are, these are uses wholly compatible with residential neighborhoods, wholly compatible with commercial office buildings. Yet we have this obsolete notion that they have to be segregated and walled off as if people were dealing with rolling mills and steel and noxious chemicals. Um, so what we had to do in the past, and I think what we have to do uh, in the next eight years on, under the new administration, is rethink the two underlying structures that helped us transition from the 19th into the 21st, so we can transition from the 19th into the 20th, so we can transition into the 21st century to allow us to do two things. Accommodate the integrated change of use, which is not only manufacturing, but in New York, the demise of the hierarchical nature of our office market. You know, 20 years ago, you know, Everybody wanted to be in the corner office, and the corner office should be on the corner of Park Avenue and 52nd Street. Um, and that was the pinnacle. Everybody understood what it was. And that's now silly. Um, people want to work all over our city. People want to work in neighborhoods that are diverse. They want to work on the water. The single hierarchical definition of a Class A office is, does not fit the creative worker of New York City in the 21st century. Um, our zoning doesn't reflect that or accommodate it. Our transportation networks don't reflect it or accommodate it. So we have a set of, of underlying market dynamics in manufacturing and, and in the office market that have to be reflected in a different way of land use planning and, and land use regulation. And that has to continue to get married to this alternative delivery system. So. In brief, Jesse, I think the answer to where we are going is uh, a, a regulatory path that reflects changes in the character of the office market, changes in the character of the manufacturing system, that provides tailored and specialized zoning requirements for our waterfront areas. Then a series of new special purpose entities that can take the older industrial areas uh, and manage that transition so it's pro-manufacturing, pro-affordable housing, pro-office, and pro-public access. Thank you, and I hope to address um, those special purpose entities in our questions specific to who uh, takes the risk and who bears the return and, and levels of governance and how that works. Um, let's shift now, if we can, over to Istanbul. And, uh, and Ulas, if you uh, could give us... Uh, there's a, a background on uh, the state of affairs in terms of the institutional and organizational components. Um, okay. Um, uh, in the morning session, uh, we had an uh, um, Im impression on uh, the, the formation of the coastal zone and waterfronts. Uh, in, in Istanbul, uh, it's highly, highly fragmented. And uh, since its development of the history, uh, it uh, changed over time during the functions. 
Um, I'd like to give some references to the other cities in order to explain the case of Istanbul. For instance, uh, um, the, uh, the, re the capital city function uh, uh, has been lost in Rio. It was the same in Istanbul. So the all the port areas, as far as, 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 far as the other uh, public functions, uh, were not anymore uh, functioned. Uh, so when the uh, capital goes to Ankara, then this vacant land happened. And same for the industry. Therefore, um, the industry located in, in, in the um, Golden Horn era, uh, area yeah, was one of the characteristics of the city and social and economic life. Therefore, uh, it uh, resulted with the highly environmental challenges. When I was a child, uh, it was uh, stinking and for the, uh, around uh, several kilometers. You cannot walk around that area. Um, in, in the 1980s, the li liberal uh, agenda is introduced, uh, and uh, the state interventions on the coastal zone um, uh, emerged, and the current conditions are institutionally uh, structured. Um, like the Bosphorus zone uh, designated as a special uh, development uh, area, had a very special, uh, 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 highly central local and local government uh, institutions involved for the, the redevelopment of the area uh, with the special zoning regulations. On the other hand, uh, um, um, the first time ever uh, um, and the um, coastal zones uh, filled uh, and uh, continuous waterfront access uh, uh, for the cars enabled. Uh, industrially, industries decentralized uh, and uh, the vacant land uh, uh, occurred. Um, another reference to Rio uh, is uh, the city making dynamics. Um, how the city is being shaped is actually not so with the planning or zoning uh, uh, um, impressions, but more uh, with the real estate dynamics. And it based on the highly fragmented uh, uh, structure of the uh, uh, land tenure, who owns the land. And according to who owns the land, uh, it highly depends on uh, uh, who you are and uh, how you are close to the government. Um, these geographies, starting from the uh, um, Central e Eastern Asia, uh, Central Eastern Europe to Asia in general, uh, two business cultural uh, uh, facts are uh, highly dominant. High power distance and uncertainty avoidance. And this in, in the business uh, has also reflections in, in the, uh, in the uh, social life and the restructuring of, of the uh, um, coastal zones in, with uh, respect to the waterfront developments, especially in the Golden Horn. Um, old slaughterhouse turned into a cultural center, an old first electricity plant of the city transformed into a, 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 a school, uh, old uh, factories turned into education, uh, but it goes step by step. With that respect, with uh, having not a, a single and monolithic uh, uh, approach on zoning, somehow helps the natural and ongoing way and the, uh, uh, the recovery of the Golden Horn area uh, in terms of eco uh, ecological regeneration is a really su success story on the one hand. When we come to the uh, uh, port developments, especially right now we are discussing on uh, Galata uh, port, uh, it's actually so simple. It's a highly uh, uh, long, long uh, term leasing, uh, long term lease of the uh, land uh, and a simple privatization process. And it's, it's looping. So uh, based on, according to your question, uh, we are living in a moment again because uh, at almost a decade ago it was a similar tender happened. And now it's happening again. But what changed? Um, the actors changed. Even some actors didn't change, uh, but the conditions and the circumstances has changed. Um, um, Turkey became more, much more centralized uh, country, but on the hand, other hand, a uh, very strong uh, uh, um, local government, but the strength and uh, the power shifts are highly dynamic on the other hand. Uh, here we see the judicial, legislative and executive processes uh, in redevelopment of the area. Uh, therefore, um, in terms of zeitgeist, the, the, the spirit of our time uh, is uh, the restructuring of the judicial system uh, uh, which uh, doesn't work efficiently, uh, which goes towards the more uh, business as usual processes. So uh, from which perspective you are looking at, you can find a different reality. Businessmen want to develop it, of course. Um, um, the new public management want to get money, and uh, uh, people want to uh, uh, somehow access to the land. So um, I think uh, this institutional uh, uh, um, learning aspect due to the waterfront development is highly based on, uh, according to my uh, opinion, uh, the international uh, references like 
um, really, India and uh, New York and uh, Brazil are, uh, they have um, some aspects similar in Istanbul. Not all, in terms of time dimension and in terms of uh, uh, culture. So uh, to your point about cycles of institutional learning and uh, let's say a failure to recognize best practices in past cycles and, and, and really in the previous generation, now with the uh, reformation on some level, particularly at the judicial level, um, which now has some degree and measure of oversight of, uh, uh, as a matter of process, um, where do we fit in then in terms of best practices? Um, you know, one of the, uh, in previous conversations, you discussed that one of the problems uh, has essentially been the speed. Um, yep. The fact that, that development was happening at such a great speed, um, it wasn't um, that the, the public was complaining about uh, lack of participation or lack of engagement, it was just the speed and the speed itself was in, inherently. Do you think, and, and also you've given reference to the environmental component of the early policy engagements. Do you think that from, uh, is there room, uh, in this case in the United States is a, is a, and in many other countries, there's a reference point where uh, the judicial process becomes a moment of engagement through environmental review, for instance. Do you see that level of oversight happening, whether it's through an environmental regulations or in general, do you see that judicial branch playing a larger role in oversight that indirectly engages the public? Um. <clears throat> This restructuring, institutional restructuring process uh, um, facilitates different capacities. But uh, if you look at from the network perspective, um, this uh, conventional uh, uh, tool somehow doesn't work. A conservation board, judicial system, uh, legal framework. I'm strongly uh, looking at, try to look at from the uh, power distance uh, perspective, which really, in reality, shapes all kind of uh, formation. And it's, um, and the, the international examples, especially culturally similar uh, examples, uh, are highly relevant uh, in order to reflect uh, the uh, learning process. Because uh, since 19th century, uh, Turkey and Istanbul is only looking for the Northwest uh, um, European examples, know nothing about the United States, nothing about India, nothing about emerging markets. So uh, the question is about how we are, the way, uh, the way we are learning, how we learn. So um, um, if uh, uh, this uh, learning uh, perspective facilitates, then there is a chance, other than a uh, loop is going for forever. Great, thank you. I think at this point we'll turn over to Mumbai, and if we could get the clicker here, then advance. Uh, to the I'm going to talk about the institutional structure for a coastal area as well as the port, and port is one of the major area on the coastal uh, coast of uh, Mumbai and also Navi Mumbai. Yeah, uh, this is the structure uh, which is govern which governs the ports, and this has emerged only after 1950s when India became independent. Before that, it was the port authority which was controlled by the British government and uh, through the governor uh, of the state government as well as the local body. So there was a complete coordination at all the levels. But uh, once we ha uh, this structure was accepted uh, by constitutional changes, uh, the port areas were transferred to the central government at the Delhi government. Uh, and state and the local government were totally disconnected from the port area, port planning, port operations, or any decision on the port. Only uh, if you see at operation level, uh, only in 1991, some private operators were uh, allowed and some private ports were also started in the region and they, these ports are under, this, uh, under the state government, uh, which allows them the coastal areas and central government uh, gives permission to them. So basically state level and central level are coordinating with each other. However, the local administration, local cities are completely disconnected. They don't interact with the port authorities. And if at all, they have to interact, they have to interact either with state or with the center. As a result, when Mumbai is facing challenges of land and port is declining, they are not able to get excess land which is lying vacant or unused in the port 
uh, for the city use and the city is not able to influence either the state or the central government to change its policy or for the portland only uh, last month uh, central government has given some go ahead for port authorities individual port authorities to look at the land policies and release the surplus land which is not used by the port to the city areas but that action has to still emerge so what i'm going to say about mumbai there are two ports in the region one is old mumbai port and one is across uh, the bay which is a new mumbai airport with a port which is called jnpt jawaharlal nehru port trust and if you look at the central government planning they have seen that mumbai airport mumbai port is very small it is unviable it is it is to be closed down that is the policy in 1980s when jnpt was established with uh, more than 2500 hectares of land acquired and a brand new port t- taken place uh, to address the containerization technology speed as well as depth was available and hinterland was available and now it is getting connected to uh, the hinterland in the south and the north with high speed rail link only for the freight so it uh, industries industrial policy and port policy are getting merged at the same time mumbai port is allowed to decline because it is not viable as a commercial port anymore however the port authority locally is not able to take any decision uh, because of lack of support from bottom up to pressurize the and get the land for the city and city is also not able to really grab the land and opportunity which is available on the front of the city second problem faced by the whole coastal area of these two cities is that most of the coastal land 500 meters from the high tide level is controlled by the crz that is coastal regulatory zone and there is absolutely no development possible in any of these 500 meters except the central authority when it gives permission which gives permission to either airport ports or its own naval expansion and mumbai is again a naval headquarters so there is a lot there are too many contenders for the coastal area too many regulations and complete lack of coordination among the three layers of government and as you see uh, bombay port has been bypassed by the high speed corridor in spite of them asking again and again and railways are not taking cognizance of that because central government doesn't want mumbai port to continue so the question is how long it will take so and if you look at the numbers this is what the situation is uh bombay port is almost running at a loss it has got huge surplus land which has huge land value but it is not able to utilize and 66% of its profits go to the salaries and the pensions while uh, the cost uh, at jnpt is very cost effective they are expanding very fast with ppps and other projects with technology and competing with the global ports so this is what uh, the scenario is in mumbai where well, mumbai city is going down it's striving for getting land it's not able to grab that land for it yeah to john's point about home rule is a limitation in terms of our own domestic uh, um, uh, regulatory system here in the united states when you look at mumbai i i i in the geography to me is clear that you have interests of the navy you have the old port and you have the new port essentially yes. and they all have very uh disparate uh intense and centralized governmental structures do you see a future where there is some level of within the central government some coordination within a central agency or would that just be complicating and adding additional regulatory burden uh, at present what i see in, at the central government that they want to uh, take action but uh, it is not able to generate consent from the state government as well as local government for transformation for example closing down of bombay port was actually uh, written down uh, in 1970s when the order for new port was passed that eventually when jnpt becomes operational the land should go to the city but city is not able to see that it is an opportunity to 
take the land because city is not independently governed by a political mayor and it has to go through the state and the state chief minister is not never from mumbai and whether so he he doesn't take uh, interest into the issues of mumbai and he takes issues more re relevant to the state so basically uh, it's a log jam of policy uh, we are trying to negotiate uh, how these three authorities come together they talk with each other and we uh, we formed the legal framework similar to what uh, uh, new york had done earlier uh, and also if you look at the development plan of mumbai it doesn't show the coastal area as uh, it's uh, in the within the planning purview neither it shows the port as if it's part of the city so it leaves it white it, it no color mm -hmm. so that is the that is a problem with uh, how to negotiate these three levels well, thank you very much and i think it offers a great comparative perspective uh for vitor here in terms of transitioning from thinking about a uh, a, a system driven largely by a central presence in a federal system um, to one uh, largely driven by market presence and perhaps you could give us some context along yes, those lines. I'll try to be brief and explain a little bit of the transaction but in Rio uh, in the left side we can see the city of Rio de Janeiro they established a company called Sedurpe uh, which was in charge of all the development in terms of the infrastructure so they organized it a competitive bid through which uh, we brought a concessionaire to take care of the place and the serv services for 15 years. Uh, and Kaisha, we, we designed a solution using two investment funds, which are in blue here, two boxes, and Sedurpi, they put inside this first fund, which we call Região do Porto, the air rights. So in Rio de Janeiro, as some guys put here, and they issued air rights to finance all the infrastructure costs. So they put these air rights, and air rights in Brazil, different of what they are here in the US, I believe, they are a tradable bond, so you can buy and sell it. So we put this CEPAX inside a fund that Caixa was managing, and this fund sold the CEPAX through a public auction to the other fund that Caixa has designed and set as well, and we brought to the second fund, which is Porto Maravilha Fund, as they call it, an investor, which is FGTS, which is a Brazilian long-term investor in infrastructure. It's a 15-year investment. It's not easy finding uh, such a long-term investor, but we were able to do that fortunately. And this fund bought all the air rights of the region. And as well, we bought seven strategic land plots. And all these assets are inside the second fund, Porto Maravilha Fund, and we, uh, the revenues that the first fund is going to make with the sales of those assets, they have to go to the infrastructure. But it's important to say here that the money doesn't go back to Sidurpi and they pay the, the infrastructure. We pay Caixa, the bank, we, keep, we pay directly the infrastructure. We didn't want to have the risk of not having the infrastructure of the municipality making something else with the money. We wanted to be assured that the money would go to the infrastructure. So the second fund assumed the whole obligation of the infrastructure revitalization, which is 8 billion reais in 15 years. So we are not paying all this amount of money in the first moment. We are paying the fund and then the concessionaire as long as they need, as the infrastructure place goes on. So today in the second fund, we have uh, air rights and we have land. So we are selling these assets to the developers in order so that they can develop the areas. So we, we are doing a thing that's important to, to help the development go faster, which is we are not selling uh, CEPAX, and, 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 which is the name of the air right in Brazil, and land. And we are not selling it in the first moment. We are swapping those assets for stakes in the developments so that the developer can, they do, doesn't have to make a very relevant upfront investment on the land or the air right. So by swapping it, we are somehow helping more developments happen in Porto Maravilha. And uh, this second fund is a 15, uh, 15 year fund, so we can wait. We are, we are going through a bad moment in Brazil in terms of growth. 
So it's good because we have time to wait. We don't have to, to sell our assets very fast. So it's what's happening today. So in, in addition to the interme intermediary function that Kaisha is essentially serving with the CPACs, and essentially a, a unitized, monetized FAR, you're, you're essentially taking equity positions. And that has some, let's say, potential structural risk to your larger um, uh, fiscal health of the organization. Uh, and, and at the same time, uh, one has to recognize that the private sector in terms of the lending community also needs, will eventually have to be engaged. Kaisha can't do this alone in terms of construction, finance, long-term equity, mortgage, debt financing, sure. et cetera. Uh, wh what is the position in terms of the banking regulatory community uh, for oversight on this on some level? Because Kaisha being, uh, you know, our equivalent of a GSC, a government-sponsored entity on some level, or the government has some position in the entity. Um, what, is there any uh, preferential engagement in terms of underwriting or evaluating these assets that's enabling the private sector? Or, or, or what's really holding back in some, in some sense uh, the private lending sector from getting in here? Is it is just the time's not right yet, or in, in what sense uh, do you see that role in terms of the, the banking regulatory component of it? Well, actually, we have an investment committee uh, in the fund, and this investment committee is uh, is the, the the place where we decide what to do. We have an external advisor, which is Hein, is a company very known here in the United States to make like technical decisions. Mm -hmm. And, and the fund is really uh, open to to do any any deals that which is which comes to, for us. It's a, always a matter of risk and return, mm -hmm. so it's that simple in the level of the fund. And it's important to say that both funds uh, they are audited by uh, Ernest Young, for example. They are audited as well uh, through TCU, which is a Brazilian agency which is responsible for uh, auditing public expenses. Although this money is not public, it's private. Mm -hmm. So we, I, I believe we have a very good accountability at the level of the fund. Yeah, and, and, and John, I, I'll, I'll turn over to you with a question uh, specific to risk return and accountability and so forth. Um, for our foreign guests, um, there has been some uh, recent debate uh, with the Port Authority. Uh, the New York, New Jersey Port Authority. It started with a uh, particular scandal about closing the George Washington Bridge. Um, the governor of the state of New York comes in and takes over some pro projects. You have some empirical uh, academic research that comes out that says um, that really the Port Authority is, yes, in its core functions, bridge, will tun bridge tunnel, et cetera, it's making money, it's doing well, but in some of these uh, special interest projects, it's, it's not doing quite well. Uh, could you give us a little background and in, in terms of the, the history of the evolution of the Port Authority and where you see it going, uh, and it, will it unravel in some sense? Uh, will it fragment further, or will it just be a matter of uh, refining and focusing on the projects that, are, it's, uh, that was intended in the first place? Um, our Port Authority, one of the really great public institutions of the United States, was, was created by an act of Congress to create the infrastructure that drives uh, uh, our mobility in the region. Uh, they own the airports, they own the port, um, and they own the principal bridges and tunnels. Uh, a mission they performed admirably for, for several generations. Uh, there was a move because, principally because of the lack of capital in the municipal and state governments. Uh, to utilize the uh, long-term revenue potential of the Port Authority, which is its great, great asset. Its ability to collect fees from people who cross bridges and fees from people who use airports. Uh, to use these securitized sources of revenue to perform uh, large-scale capital functions that uh, local government and state government was constrained given the, the, the underlying financial health. Um, you know, I think that was by and large a good thing uh, and has produced, uh, I think, much more benefit to the region than, than, than harm. Uh, we've had a, a, a scandal uh, in the last uh, several months. Uh, the Port Authority has no monopoly on scandal. Uh, <laughs> uh, to, uh, to have state government pointing the finger at, at the Port Authority is, is ironic at the, at the very least. Um, so I, I don't think you can say that there's anything endemic in the structure of the Port Authority. 
Uh, we have private organizations, state governments, local governments, uh, both our state governments, frankly, New York and New Jersey, uh, are, are hardly paragons of civic virtue. Um, so I don't think uh, uh, this is, a, I believe, sort of a passing uh, 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 event. You know, the longer-term question is, is, is what are the underlying sources of capital that drive waterfront development? And, you know, Vashon asked, I thought, a very useful question in the earlier session about the trade-off between the use of, of the public sector's capital as we did in Battery Park City in which uh, the government issued long-term debt, it built roads, uh, it installed sewers, it created parks, and produced, uh, even after a bankruptcy, an enormously accretive development that has financed affordable housing and continues to provide tens of millions of dollars of revenue a year uh, that is an essential revenue stream to the city of New York. Um, if we compare that to the Hudson Yards, which is being done with private capital, and putting aside the, the merits of the two plans, uh, in, the, in the second model, uh, the government has no access to land appreciation. Uh, the government has no ability to modify and change the plan uh, over time as markets change. Because the government made a decision that it didn't have the capital resources itself, and therefore it had to outsource it. Now, uh, I think that has questionable ramifications both on control, but it also has very questionable ramifications on, on cost, which gets passed on. Um, I mean, right now, uh, the spread in the cost of capital to a government uh, compared to the cost of capital to the related company, one of the finest developers uh, uh, in our city and in our country, uh, is enormous. And so the public is paying a massive tax uh, based on the spread of capital by the decision to privatize the capital raising function. And that, that's a tax which could have gone into public amenities, could have gone into a, a whole series of things, but goes to pay necessary returns and cost of capital to a series of debt and equity investors. So I think the, the, the core question of the Port Authority, Jesse, is where do we get the capital that allows the government to make long-term strategic decisions in waterfront infrastructure. Yeah, I think that's a good segue in a way to the mechanics of Mumbai. Uh, in the old port uh, area, you know, something like 50% of the land is otherwise laying fallow, is empty warehouses. At the same time, this land abuts uh, on the financial district, and it's a growing and expanding financial district. It's important to the larger uh, labor economy in terms of financial services, et cetera. Um, in, in previous discussions, you had mentioned that uh, essentially the port would maintain uh, control of the land and would work on uh, ground leases. And you seem to think that uh, in terms of both the scalability of future development and the timing and pace, that it would be uh, somewhat accretive. It would be small steps one step at a time. Could you speak on some level to those mechanics of, of the, the economic relationship in terms of the infrastructure uh, and the relationship uh, specific yes. between the ground lease? Uh, for example, uh, there, were, there are proposals uh, like abandon the whole of Mumbai port at one go, plan for the city and port area, like uh, port authority generate a lot of infrastructure funds, which are, I think, 150 thousand billion dollars that is what is estimated or if whole of land belonging to be Bombay Port Trust is uh, allowed to be commercially utilized but that is not possible because uh, uh, as it is 50 percent is and utilized by port for certain functions like uh, uh, liquid petroleum uh, transportation uh, refineries and other uh, which will not go immediately uh, so 50% land which has been made available, which is abetting the southern part, which is near the financial uh, city center. So part of it, uh, some of the estates, uh, they will be uh, available uh, to uh, certain public authorities, uh, to, uh, for example, housing board, which is a public author authority, might get some lands for affordable housing as well as waterfront development. and. Part of it could be commercialized, but 
port authority will not allow the ownership to be transferred so the policy uh, at present what has been thought of that it will be 30 years lease uh, which will be continually uh, uh, upgraded after 30 years and uh, as and when uh, the land becomes available it will be uh, made available to various developments uh, so the uh, out of 200 or 300 hectares uh, at present some of the hectares some of the parcels which are about 10 to 20 hectares will be developed at one place so there won't be a master planning but it will be a dynamic planning as and when how to merge it with the city suppose some 10 hectares which is very close to the transportation network can we develop it as a TOD model uh, so I see a gradual uh, incremental planning process and not completely uh, a master plan uh, of the end product and then go ahead with development of land, which seems a little impossible because there are too many pressures. There are pressures for development of marina, there are pressures for development of financial sector, uh, hospitality industry, also the education campuses or uh, hospital, because medical center is, uh, Bombay is one of the um, main uh, medical research center. So there are many, many contenders. So it will be some way public-private partnerships and the land will be gradually and incrementally going into other places. But I, I see no whole, wholesale uh, conversion of land in a very short period. Yeah, I think that's an interesting contrast to, to Rio in a way, where Puerto Maivea is being uh, master planned in a way. Um, and essentially, for those of you who are not familiar, it's building a new central business district for Rio. Um, not only a business district, right? There's a cultural component, and admittedly, um, but it's, it, it is uh, undoubtedly, in a comparative perspective on some level, um, ambitious. And so, uh, and there's an awful lot of, particularly our office development going in, and, and there's there's a, there's a lot of, of um, in terms of the timing, um, the, the pressure one gets from the Olympics, World Cup, etc. That's accelerating the pace of the sort of natural uh, uh, market or development of a market. What, in terms of timing, how do you see that relating to your positions? And is there ability or uh, as, an, as a structural process for you to slow down? in a way, or is it just built on a constant inertia of, of speculative development? It's low down the infrastructure, you mean, expenses. Yeah. It could be. There is a legal possibility of doing this, but we don't mm -hmm. want. Right. That's why we brought an investor with a 15-year grace period. He can wait. That's the point. Mm -hmm. He can wait. An important thing is that although uh, we, we want it to be a commercial district, we want it as well to be a residential destin. It has to be. It has to be a mixed-use area. We are very aware of that. So uh, residential developments, they are less cyclical, I would say this. Mm -hmm. So we have a huge demand in Rio de Janeiro for residential. So uh, we believe that uh, perhaps uh, commercial developments will go slower, but residential developments will, will do good in the short term, in the, 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 in the long term. So. It will help uh, renovating the area anyway. So, that's I think to happen. the point about the cyclical nature of housing, let's say the inelasticity of pricing and price control specific to housing, are we talking about condominium for sale, rental, or some mix? And even within the rental, are there what are the divisions in terms of relative affordability, well, or is it just all market rate? The largest demand is for condominiums. People mm -hmm. in Brazil they want to buy, they want to own the departments. They don't mm -hmm. like to rent. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Interesting. It's the same. <clears throat> um, yeah, there's no rental housing policy, and uh, it's the same for the, uh, Istanbul and Turkey, uh, culturally. And I think one last question, and we'll turn it over and bring it back to Istanbul. Um, in our discussions, it's business as usual, you've described yeah. it. There's a certain momentum there that happens. And if you look in organizational terms, you'll even see at the bottom of the screen that there's even a separate entity which has a certain autonomy in and of itself. Well, and this is sort of a broad question, but I think it one that unites many of the panels today in terms of the relationship with planning. Where do you see the public's role in here? There's been an awful lot of new amenities, waterfront mountains, some infill parks, Turkmenistan Park, I believe it is. Uh, and, and on some level, that speaks to this notion of 
of, um, of open space and amenities which people seek, but really as a matter of process, where do you see that? Uh, again, going back to a notion of institutional learning, where within these organizations and institutions does the public um, have a greater say in the planning and development process? <clears throat> The amount of plants are uh, huge. Uh, master plants, city plants, uh, environmental plants, coastal zone planning. Uh, on paper, when you look at those uh, 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 fragmentation, uh, the uh, lack of coordination <coughs> is become an issue. But it's somehow hiding uh, the <coughs> reality of the business nature. Somehow, uh, uh, some public uh, 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 institutions act as private, and some private institutions try to act public. It's a very uh, interesting um, mm -hmm. uh, momentum in a way. And uh, in terms of these uh, great landfills, uh, um, rather than plan making, uh, it's highly relevant to the planning, because it's the planning is the process of interaction uh, where uh, uh, the maturity level of decision making and the role of public sector with regard to the public interest uh, will uh, change, because now, the, the most fuzziest, uh, one of the most fuzziest uh, concepts, public interest, now being used as in, in justifying the privatization. And um, so um, the role of the institutions are among, uh, they, they are more central. Yeah. I, I just urge a, a, a note of caution about how we allow the market to define as a sole parameter the functional attributes of our 21st century waterfronts. I mean, these waterfronts were in manufacturing and, and trade uses for a couple of centuries. To say that we're going to pick a given five or eight year cycle to define their character for the next century, I think is very short sighted of us. And there's a certain inherent character to these places. The, the magic of, of all of our cities is, a, is much about where uh, uh, the urban framework meets the water's edge. And to have that character shaped for 50, 60, 70 years because of a three-year market cycle uh -huh. in which residential happens to be hot or office happens to be hot, um, I think is, is, is not in the best interests of the utilization of the edge. And we need a financing system that allows for the patients to take the kind of, you know, richness and diversity and energy, which makes all of our four cities special, yeah. and bring it to the edge and not produce these zones of monoculture that we've seen, I think, in too many of the uh, rush developments at the urban edge on the water. And I think that's a perfect summation. Um, and perhaps we could turn now to questions and answers. Uh, well, questions, that is. If anybody has any questions in the audience. There's a question for John. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Caught in the act. I know. Not for the first time. I couldn't time. get your surname, but uh, can I call you John, sir? Yeah. Uh, so uh, the question is that, you know, we have Istanbul, uh, Mumbai even more. Uh, we are all, you know, relatively backward to the U.S., Rio. Uh, we look. We send our children to the U.S. to study. We look up to the U.S. as you know. Wow, they know everything. They'll teach us how to do things. And we hear you have these problems in New York, and you can't even plan for 15 years ahead. You know, uh, how do we address that? I mean, we, uh, what are we to learn? Is it that? Uh, is it a failure of democracy here? Uh, are we seeing? Are we seeing? Um, you know. Uh, how do you see it uh, going ahead, or with it, uh, it should remain muddled and uh, let it, uh, f you know, let the streams flow on its own pace? Um, if I have to look at the most exciting and transformative things we've done along our waterfront, um, the enormous force of the intervention of Brooklyn Bridge Park, um, the uh, creation of a whole new environment at Battery Park City, the transformation of the Hudson waterfront. Um, I would say these are models that, that the whole world can learn from. And I think what they can learn are three or four key things. One is the absolute necessity of vigilant, 
organized, persistent public engagement. You know, the Brooklyn waterfront is made better by the passion of the citizens of that borough. Um, the passion of the people who live along the west side for that waterfront have made it a better waterfront. And, I, you know, we are a messy government. We're a confused government. We're sure as heck not an efficient government. But a lot of that, I think, has led to uh, uh, a much better urban form. The second thing is to, um, and I think at GSAP this is an important thing to say, let our best landscape architecture talent, our best urban design talent, our best architectural talent, uh, you know, give them license to do what they can do and create spaces that are magical spaces, that are transformative buildings, that are extraordinary parks, um, that are, these are legacy spaces and they deserve legacy environments. So what, who's stopping them in the U.S.? Um, you know, I, I, I think the good news in, 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 in New York is that for every one that's been stopped, there's been three that have been fabulous. Um, you know, if you look at, you know, the work of Michael Van Valkenburg, the work of James Corner in terms of shaping these environments, uh, the work that CHOP and others are doing along the Brooklyn waterfront, um, you know, so I, I, I think we have produced through the talent uh, of allowing our designers uh, to express their genius in these spaces. Uh, and we all owe a credit, I think, to uh, really one of the few bipartisan agreements I've seen in my career. Um, you can go back to you know, the Republican governor, George Pataki, and his passion for the New York City waterfront. Uh, you know, Mayor Giuliani left very little physical legacy. The legacy that he left was on the waterfront. Um, Michael Bloomberg's extraordinary commitment, and I'm confident now in his own way, you know, Mayor de Blasio. So we've had a 25-year history of so it's bipartisan but it's commitment. individual executives and brilliant minds architects who have done it rather than uh, street side I, movement. I, I think it's, no, I think it's, it's, it's you know, Yes, it's taken, every one of these projects had a powerful political champion. Not a single one happened without a mayor or a governor who said, I want yeah, this. That's, yeah. that's, so that's, that was necessary. That and I think Secondly, so. it had a great design talent. So, Thirdly, it had a financial structure that kept it away from the legislature and allowed and it to be off budget. So where financed. does the ground street level public opinion come into the whole the, game? You know, Street level public opinion in New York's like a tsunami. It's, 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 it's not everywhere. something. It's not it's something everywhere. one holds back. It's just chaos. Um, chaos. And it's it's, it's, it's persistent. It's 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 omnipresent. Mm -hmm. And you know, for every tortuous, painful minute that those of us who do this live with, there are minutes of insight and passion that make these places better. And I th I think so it's Kate standing up, which makes me know that well, we. Yeah, and I think it, it, this is about leadership, and it's not just about GSAP designers. It's also about a, a development education that gives value and recognition to quality of place. And so I think that's much of what we're trying to accomplish here. Thank you to the panelists, and thank you all. Thank you.